<clears throat> then he claimed to have heard a third shot. However, perhaps Kellerman's chat with William Manchester comes closest to reality. He stated he ordered Greer to leave the scene and radioed the alarm to Lawson just before the fatal final shot. And this is the quote from uh, Kellerman. Greer then looked in the back of the car. Maybe he didn't believe him. The Zabruder film is conclusive. Kellerman turns to Greer. Greer then turns his head back to the front. Kellerman then puts the radio mic in his left hand up to his face. And then Greer turns back to stare at JFK for the second time until after the fatal shot makes its mark. It's basically a situation where they're going down, okay, and first shot were shots, excluding all this, you know, the, the conference with the front or the back. Shots right now, that's back. He looks back. He's a trained Secret Service agent, like I told you before. And, you know, government is probably going to turn back. That's human nature. I mean, whether it was a breakdown in training, it was human instinct. They hear a sign, they look back. Even Kellerman looked back. You can see him turn around, and he's like, he looked back. Now, in this motion, and, and Kennedy's like this, and, uh, and there's still a few more seconds for the fatal shot. Just to come. Kellerman, when he turns back, he, he pauses for just a moment. And obviously, you can't read lips from the other side of the car, so I'm not going to pretend to be a lip reader here. It's according to what Kellerman said in the actions of the film. When he turns back, according to his testimony, he says, get out of here, we've been hit. And then he turns back around. And Greer has turned back around and so does everybody else. Now, and this is in the film, when Kellerman's got his hand back up here with, with the microphone, which you can see, that's when Bill Greer turns back around and stares at Kennedy again. Obviously, this foot on the brakes, the car's not going any faster. And then that's where you read in the books where he, then the fatal shot makes its mark, and only then does he turn around, and only then does he accelerate the car. See, people make it like it was one look back. Okay, and it does it, but there's two looks back. So this uh, mumbo jumbo about, well, it was just a you know, mistake or human instinct. I don't buy that at all. Dash survivor's guilt. The Secret Service and the JFK murder. We'll hear from him now, Mr. Palomaro. Okay, 10 minutes. I guess I'm going to cut to the chase a little bit. Um, yeah, my study is basically you know, pretty unique. It's interviewed close to 20 uh, former members of the Secret Service, guarded Kennedy. In fact, guarded from FDR up to President Carter. One might have actually been uh, around the Reagan days, but he was in the field office. And during the course, I'm going to take this off for a second. During the course of uh, my research, I started out with a lot of the same beliefs and a lot of the evidence and a lot of the way things were told to us by Jim Bishop, William Manchester, the Warren Report, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that you know Kennedy didn't want this done. He didn't, you know, he didn't want the bubble top. He didn't want anything on the back of the limousine, etc., etc. And since my natural focus was on the Secret Service, that's always in my area of interest anyway, I delved into that. And I believed a lot of those things at first, but then as I found out through interviewing these men and comparing things, primary sources, documents, films, etc., etc., through the years, I found out a lot of these things categorically are not true. JFK has been blamed for a lot of things that he supposedly did want done security-wise, which aren't true. Um, I'm going to be showing a video in a second, but before I get to that, I'm just going to get to something uh, that relates to earlier. Randy Robertson, Dr. Randy Robertson, had a presentation about uh, basically making one story short the back of the head JFK was gone, a big uh, part of the pond here, bone of contention, uh, you know, with researchers, I know that was bad. But anyway, um, when I spoke to the driver of the fog car, Sam Kinney, um, reading my notes here, he revealed that having witnessed the assassination, from um, you know, the follow-up car, he was watching the back of President Kennedy's head anyway. He had to maintain a five-foot distance. That was standard operating procedure. Five-foot distance between his car and the limousine. When the shooting happened, he saw it all happen. He also said there was no missed shot. And that's just what he said. All three shots hit their victims. He thinks that the second shot he caught it. More importantly, he saw the back of the head go off. Um, Secret Service responsible for the motor case vehicle order too, which was also changed. Um, the limousines, uh, or I'm sorry, the motorcycles, there was 18 motorcycles allotted Kennedy on all the prior Texas stops, again unique to Dallas. It was changed at the 11th hour by the Secret Service. Allegedly, hey, Kennedy didn't want motorcycles by him because he wanted conversation, but boy, geez, uh, just a few hours before, he didn't mind those motorcycles going right beside him. 
Um, ambulance, I want to be on standby in case of injury. JFK was gone from the scene a few minutes before the shooting. How many were there? There weren't 18 before. It was 18. It went down to four. And to make matters worse, that insult to injury, they weren't even right by them. They weren't even riding parallel. And this is all, again, blamed on JFK. And for what it's worth, Sam Kinney and Rufus Youngblood said that there's no truth to that. In fact, Rufus Youngblood threw in an expletive that I can't repeat. Um, basically, you got a situation to sum up because I'll give somebody else their time. Um, JFK and LBJ LB were in the same city, same motorcade, and slow-moving open vehicles in close proximity to each other. And this was unique. Winston Lawson told me this, and Abraham Bolton told me this. Um, it's just basically it's the reason why the President and the Vice President travel on different planes. You're never supposed to have them in a compromising situation so close to each other. And again, oh, unique to Dallas, and there's old Lee Harvey Oswald, just a coincidence, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you'll hear from Vince Palomara uh, on some of the work he's done in the Secret Service. Uh, and time permitting, you'll, you'll hear some, some things from me on the Warren O mission. Okay. <clears throat> Our next speaker is a uh, young, young researcher who's been involved in a case for a number of years um, and who has certainly done the right thing and said, uh, basically, there's, there's one area I want to look into, and I want to look into it in, as intensively as I can. And believe me when I tell you, he has done so. Um, in studying the not-so-secret service, uh, Vince Palomar has done a, an incredible job of bringing some things to light. Uh, he was in the, in the post COPA review of last year when, when, when people filled out the little forms and said, what did you like, what, did you, you know, what were the high points? Vince Palomaro's presentation was literally at the top of uh, the scale for, for what happened last year, and we're, we're, very, uh, we're very honored to have him back with us this year. So please welcome and give your full attention to Vince Palomaro as we continue Conspiracy in the Round. Thank you. Back in 1988, I took an intense interest in the assassination. In 1990, based off that intense interest, I focused on the Secret Service. There were many things that the Secret Service did and did not do that struck me at the time. But this was before I had done any primary research, had spoken to any of the former agents. At the time, frankly, I just didn't have the courage to call any of them or make any kind of contact. But just through the years, I just saw more and more things that led me to question. And originally, I saw everything in black and white. Everything was sinister. I think we all start out that way. We don't see shades of gray a lot of times. Everything's, you know, cuts one way or another. So to make a long story short, when I started to contact these gentlemen, slowly but surely, I expected them to, for lack of a better phrase, debunk some of my early uh, theories, speculations, whatnot. Surprisingly, not only did they corroborate many of them, they added many more layers of questions. I'm here today in 1996 to tell you that I really don't have a straight black and white answer for you. While I do not think that the Secret Service was sinisterly involved in a conspiracy, I have a hard time, a very hard time, after what I've uncovered in all the primary documentation and context I've made, sweeping everything I've found away as innocent, albeit gross negligence. And like I said in my abstract, it's a prelude to disaster. The presidential protective measures used and ignored by the Secret Service up to and including November 22nd, 1963, a visual investigation. Um, I'd like to thank, although know, he's obviously not here, Jim Cedroni from the JFK Library, provided me with many uh, films and uh, the Cecil Stoughton photographs, some of which are going to appear in this video. Other ones, he was very kind uh, to identify to the greatest certainty he could many of the uh, motorcade footage and whatnot that I compiled. Um, like I'm sure a couple of you in this room, I have a pretty extensive video library, to put it mildly. And I went through and I compiled as many uh, motorcades as I could during the Kennedy years. Very hard to find. Um, again, it's Jim Sojourney, the library said they remember your entrances and your exits and everything else in the middle doesn't mean anything. Well, I'll tell you what, if you see a lot of documentaries, they usually show the inaugural motorcade. 
and they showed Dallas. Not too many other ones, and that's created a lot of confusion. And I'm here to dispel that confusion and to spell out in a visual format what I've uncovered. So here goes. Okay, this is Broken Talk, Columbia. Two agents bought the lead boy calendar on the back of the presidential limousine. There's the full bubble pop. Excellent motorcycle formation. Close fall apart. Sam Kenny was driving that fall apart. He's maintaining maintaining a normal distance. Bright sunny day. Bob Lilly told me that many times the bubble top was on either partial or full in this configuration. investigated their drinking at the cellar, but the cellar was just like a sort of a, I don't know, what, what was the term, a beatnik like beat club, and they didn't drink alcohol there. So they said, okay, well, they didn't drink alcohol there, but they drank at the Fort Worth Press Club. And not only did they drink, nine of them drank, including four in the follow-up bar, John Reddy, Clint Hill, Paul Landis, and Glenn Bennett. Those are the four, in case you want the names. It's in the Warren Commission volume, volume 18 for the cellar reports in Fort Worth Press Club. Make a long story short, no, they were not punished in any way, and Chief Rollins said he did not want to uh, stigmatize their careers and hurt their families. And it turns out now this was actually more of a regular occurrence than we uh, think. Abraham Bolden, his interviews with me, pretty much told me that they, a lot of them were all night drinkers. And let's even just get off the idea that they were drinking. Let's even give them the benefit of the doubt and say that they weren't drinking, all the proof was they were. Well, a lot of them were up to either 3 o'clock in the morning or as late as 5 o'clock in the morning. And they had to report for duty at 7 o'clock in the morning. So they only had two to four hours of sleep. And they're going to protect the president. You talk about a reflex. That's what they live and breathe on is their reflex. Because these are trained Secret Service agents. And to not have your reflexes with the sleep deprivation, if nothing else, is going to really kill their ability to recognize shots and do things. And all of a sudden, in the time of Emory Roberts, perplexing order to, to not move. Whether that gets Clint Hill delayed, that gets John Reddy in the next film making one forward step that doesn't mean anything. Did they admit that to you in your interviews? As or far, did you ask that? As far as the drinking? They up all night. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, no, no, they, they were drinking. And, and Sam Kinney, the driver of the fall car, who, by the way, I've got to fill this in, believed that the right rear of the head was gone. Total cooperation of Clint Hill told me it twice in detail. And uh, that's in my book, you'll see that. But, uh, oh yeah, no, he in a roundabout way admitted that they drank, but he made it sound like it was not a regular thing, it was when they were off duty. But Abraham Bolton basically laid it out that this was at least a weekly thing. They went out on binges, and what's well, even a, a story that the Fort Worth uh, firefighters were in the Hotel Texas as they were drinking. And it was more than nine agents that were drinking, but it's the nine agents had the critical duties in Dallas the next day. From the moment he arrived in Dallas, the president's protection was suspect, according to Vince Palomara, a Secret Service expert. There was last minute changes invoked by the Secret Service involving President Kennedy's security. Specifically, agents were told not to ride on or near the rear of the limousine. Now these orders were funneled from the assistant special agent in charge of the White House detail, who was the planner of the Texas trip, Floyd Boring, to one of his assistants, a shift leader by the name of Emory Roberts, who was in charge of the follow-up car. Uniquely on that day in Dallas, the press, the camera crews, Kennedy's military aide, who would normally sit in the front of the president's car, and even his personal physician, were all relegated to the rear of the motorcade by the Secret Service. for you another four minute dvd but what i want to do is again it's one thing to come up here and espouse things say things and that 
but pitcher says a thousand words and it's, it's the great conundrum. Now, I said before, you know, about a conspiracy, no conspiracy, and it's separate from that. It's a matter of these guys would have protected the president. He would have lived whether Oswald act alone or not. There is a little bit of a gray area in there. And it dep quite frankly, sometimes it depends on my mood or if some of my researcher friends uh, work on me a little bit to make it, me think it is sinister. I don't know. I mean, you try to put the best foot forward and say they screwed up and the president was killed under their watch, and after the fact, they created this mythology that he was difficult to protect. And that's when you read William Manchester's massive best-selling book. It sold, like, in the millions, you know, the day Kennedy was shot, even the Warren Report, to a certain extent, laid out this thing. That, well, President Kennedy, that's a shame, but, you know, he did not want, you know, protection. Now, you didn't hear me get into the bubble top. That does seem to be something that Kennedy didn't want all the time, but even that is a gray area. There's many trips. You'll see a couple of them coming up. We had the bubble top on, if not in a full compartment, which he did quite often. A lot of other times he'd have it in a partial configuration where he'd have the rear piece on and the forward piece. Now, even though it was not bulletproof, it would deflect a bullet. And many of the agents I spoke to said it would deflect a bullet, or at the very least, actually two things, or it would uh, have a sun's glare off the uh, bubble would, would act as a deterrent, or just the fact that many people thought it was bulletproof. What a potential sniper or snipers think twice, if not thrice, about doing anything. Oh, the bubble top's on, or the rear piece is on. So there you go. Many times, um, you'll see coming up, uh, Kennedy was allotted many motorcycles that surrounded the car. It was protocol. In fact, on the Texas trip, San Antonio, Houston, and that morning in Fort Worth, the morning of the assassination, he had motorcycles all over the place in the high select committee. This is kind of, well, it's not buried. Researchers know about it, but it's buried in their um, report. Most people know about the Warren Report. High select committee reinvestigated the assassination in the late 70s and found a probable conspiracy, but very inconclusive, very unsatisfying. But one of the things they found was it was, quote, uniquely insecure what the Secret Service did with the allotment of motorcycles. And guess what? They blamed it on Kennedy. They said, hey, Kennedy didn't like this noise of the motorcycles by him. He couldn't have conversation. Geez, it must have been a new thing, because he didn't mind having those motorcycles all around him, up to and including the morning of the murder. He gets to Dallas. Hey, I want to hear now. Hey, get these motorcycles away. Hey, I didn't mind the, the agents beside me here. Oh, get them away now. And uh, yeah, the press and photographers, you wouldn't need Abraham's a brooder. Normally, the press and photographers were in front, and you'll see in a second. Again, pictures, you don't have to... Believe me, you'll see for your own. The vantage point, a lot of times there was a flatbed truck in front of the motorcades to capture. They would have the national and international press, or just like the local press and the photographers capturing the motorcade. You wouldn't need all these amateurs. Hmm, they were moved to the last minute. Tom Dillard even testified to the Warren Commission that they left them in Chevrolet convertibles that put them totally out of the picture, literally, because they were stuck way back in the motorcade. They didn't even know what happened until it was too late. If they would have been in front, they would have been filming, hey, and they would have saw everything. Again, you might say, what's motorcycles got to do? If there was a sniper, it was a sniper. No. What it was, there would have been more professional witnesses to cover. Now, they would have covered them on the sides. Yes, you're right from a sniper's perspective. But if agents, now the Secret Service has even admitted this. So this isn't like, oh, this is your theory about what they would have done. The Secret, Louis Moretti testified in the late 90s about this, okay? That if agents would have been on the back of the car, it would have obscured Oswald's view. So agents being there would have been very important. And again, so it's their own words. But again, before you know, anyone thought twice about this, they would throw out, well, President Kennedy, God bless him, it's a shame, but you know, he didn't want this protection. But as you see, he didn't have a problem at all. And I'm contacting these people. And here's the most important thing of all, especially if you go out and you get Gerald Blaine's book, which I'm not, you know, spas and dates, free country, get it if you want. You know, and if you go in there and you read and you say, well, you know, we had a code, he's talking about the Secret Service, and, uh, you know, that code shouldn't be broken. And, you know, I'm, I'm waiting 47 years to tell you that President Kennedy did indeed order us out the car and we covered this up. The thing he left out of the book, the real glaring error is, what about the non-Secret Service agents that said President Kennedy never wore us the car? You know, uh, Dave Powers, who was on every trip Kennedy uh, talk. He was riding in the fob car often, writes to us total stranger and says, they never had to be told to be, get off the back of the car. Congressman Sam Gibbons, again, total stranger, writing to him, said that the agents rode on the rear of the car all the way. He was, he was sitting a foot away from Kennedy. He never heard any order. So I'll wrap this up with a little four minute DVD. Now this, what this is, this is silent and it's four minutes long and it's a compilation of prior motorcades.
always thought uh, the valor of the Secret Service, how they would literally, you know, throw themselves in front of a potential assassin's bullets, and always fascinated me. And the question to me was always, wait a minute, why didn't these agents do more to protect the man? And the more I looked into it, the more I realized there were a lot of anomalies, a lot of questions that needed to be answered on the subject. No one has spent more time studying the Secret Service's actions that day than Vince Palomera. Standard operating procedure in an open motorcade would have been for the agents to be running, walking, or jogging with the presidential limousine. And there was also two handrails in the back for an agent or agents to hold on to so they would be in close proximity to the president. Agents not riding on the rear of the limo is a huge issue in this case. The Secret Service agents are powerless to really do much of anything if they're not close to the president. And official mythology, I like to call it, is that President Kennedy allegedly ordered the agents off the car four days before Dallas. Claiming President Kennedy asked for changes to the motorcade's normal security protocols had been a recurring theme during the Warren Commission. I spoke to the special agent in charge of the White House detail, the number one agent, Gerald Bain. I asked him, President Kennedy, I understand uh, he was difficult to print right? He didn't want the agents on the back of the car, and he told me, this is an exact quote, I don't remember Kennedy ever saying anything about not having agents on the back of the car. If you look at the newsreels, you'll see agents on there. Well, one by one, I spoke to many of his colleagues, not only in the Secret Service, but actually White House aides that were not Secret Service agents, and it was a landslide. They were all telling me the same thing. Supposedly, Kennedy ordered the agents on the back of what the President Kennedy, very nice man, not difficult to protect, did not order the agents off the back of the car. This complete departure from procedure is captured here as the motorcade begins to leave Love Field Airport in Dallas. Jogging beside the car was an agent in the fog car behind him. Another agent rises from his seat and does hand gestures like this, obviously to order him to cease and desist. The agent stops his tracks three times, not once, not twice, but three times, goes like this. And actually, that's the universal body language for what is going on. Turns out the agent name was Don Lawton, and he's the agent who's formerly told to cease and desist by shift leader Emery Roberts, who rises in his seat with the hand gestures, and you see Don Lawton going like this. Don Lawton rode on the back of the car on the Chicago trip earlier in 1963, and four days before in Tampa. But he's relegated to meaningless love field luggage duty during the motorcade, uh, during the assassination. It's ridiculous. Secret Service agent Clint Hill is also recalled from his position on the opposite side of the limousine. Emery Roberts had been the only one of three Secret Service shift leaders from the White House that was part of the motorcade. Emery Roberts was in charge of the follow-up car that was immediately behind JFK, full of Secret Service agents. He was the general, so to speak, of the follow-up car. If he said something, that's how it went. Emery Roberts, however, received his orders from Floyd Boring, the number two man of the Secret Service White House detail, based in Washington. Floyd Boring, he was in charge of planning the Texas trip, and he was the one who gave out assignments in an interview with the Assassination Records Review Board in 1996, he stated that there had been no change in policy for the Dallas trip and put the blame on President Kennedy. The number one man and head of the White House detail, Gerald Bain, was on vacation starting the week before the Texas trip, which left the immediate handling of the trip to Boring. Floyd Boring's right-hand man, in charge of the logistics on the ground in Texas was Special Agent Winston Lawson. Winston Lawson came from the Buffalo, Syracuse, New York area. He was a former counterintelligence agent in the Army, and he joined the Secret Service in 1959. And again, he was an advance agent, an agent that would actually go to the different cities, towns in America and overseas in advance to uh, work with uh, the local police and dignitaries and whatnot to get everything in line with motorcade rides, building security, etc., etc. Lawson, assisted by agent Roger Warner, set the order of the vehicles in the Dallas motorcade. The normal order would have been to have a pilot car and a lead car, which was 
done in Dallas. Then you had a flatbed truck of the press photographers in front of the limousine filming and being eyewitnesses, and that in and of itself is a deterrent. Again, you had the press buses close behind the limousine. Again, professional newsmen, eyewitnesses, they would have been there filming. Conveniently, the press has moved back at the last minute. There wouldn't have been a need for Abraham Zapruder, an amateur, to film the assassination. Another break from routine in the Dallas motorcade, the positioning of police motorcycles around the president's limousine. As with any other motorcade, the Secret Service worked hand in hand with local authorities to ensure the safety of the president. Usually surrounding the car, there would be a group of motorcycles. This was not only to obscure or block the view of potential assassins, but also to prevent anyone from the public who might be viewing who got too excited from approaching the car. And up to and including the day before the assassination, this held true. In his prior Texas stops in San Antonio, Houston, and Fort Worth, Normally, there were six to nine motorcycle officers around the presidential limousine in a wedge formation, including flanking the car, which means in translation, they were riding right beside JFK. Then all of a sudden, there is a last minute change, and the motorcycles are reduced to four beside the car, but then they're not even beside the car. They're not flanking anymore. They're moved behind. Translation, the formation was meaningless. It offered no protection at all. In fact, when the shooting began, you don't even see the motorcycle officers around the car. Agent Lawson told the Warren Commission why he had ordered the motorcycles to fall back from the limousine. Well, it's my understanding he couldn't hear a conversation well. That's why he didn't want the motorcycles beside him. And yet they had no problem that morning in Fort Worth, the day before in San Antonio and Houston, and four days before, the week before, the month before, the year before, the years before. They left Kennedy a sitting duck. Another line of protection for the president that wasn't used was the limousine's bubble top. The bubble top was a plexiglass covering that was put on the car, the presidential limousine. The conventional wisdom that it was bulletproof and bullet resistant. Turns out it was not bulletproof or bullet resistant in the standard way we think of that. However, it was a psychological deterrent because most people assumed it was bulletproof. Popular belief has it that the limousine's bubble top was not used for two reasons. One, because what started as an overcast and dreary day turned sunny and clear. The actual films and photos of several motorcades shows the bubble top on in the brightest weather conditions imaginable. So there's a myth that it was only on there for inclement weather. Not true. The bottom line with the bubble top would have done is it would have obscured an assassin's view via the sun's glare. The second reason most often given as to why the bubble top had not been used is that the president had requested not to use it. But I spoke to the agent who was the driver of the follow-up car, Sam Kinney. Sam Kinney adamantly on three different occasions told me that President Kennedy had nothing to do with it. It was solely his responsibility. The bubble top came in six pieces, but sometimes it's on there for just the front and rear pieces were on. So it would be an open car and some semblance of protection as well. A partial bubble top with the front and rear pieces on, and he would be able to get air to be able to stand up and he didn't have that configuration. It's a question of why. Why wasn't at least that configuration used in Dallas? Another troubling inconsistency with Secret Service protocols was the monitoring of buildings. Buildings were not properly monitored in Dallas. Windows were not even properly monitored by the Secret Service. When Lawson said it was his usual instructions to give out these orders to scan the windows along the parade route, but he didn't remember giving out the order or not. And it turns out that Dallas police, who were also involved in security of the motorcade route, said that no orders were given. The bottom line protocol were agents or local police or both were supposed to monitor buildings. Daily Plaza was not properly cleared, was not properly monitored, and the overpasses, any potential overpasses that would have been clear to spectators and manned by local police. Even more alarming is what happened inside the Secret Service car directly behind the president's limousine once shots rang out. Shift leader Emery Roberts would give an order to the other agents in the car. When the assassination 
begins, he orders the men not to move. Sam Kinney, the driver of the fob car, who's right beside him, confirmed to me that this happened. He ordered the men not to move at the beginning of the assassination. Henry Roberts supposedly ordered the men not to move. These men were sworn to protect the president, to dive in front of a bullet if need be, to sacrifice their body. And you mean to tell me this man is going to order them to cease and desist when the shooting begins? And just what were the Secret Service agents who were actually inside the president's limousine doing at the time of the shooting? Agents Bill Greer and Roy Kellerman were pivotal to the success of the assassination. And they were pivotal to the success of the assassination through inaction. Bill Greer was the driver of the president's limousine in Dallas. Roy Kellerman was riding right beside him. Greer hits the gas pedal. Kennedy lives. First shot rings out. Bill Greer looks back at the president. His foot's on the brake, too, because the car slows down. It's only going 11.2 miles an hour. It's crawling at this point. And then Roy Kellerman says, get out of line, we've been hit. That's when Bill Greer turns around a second time and is staring at Kennedy and doesn't do anything until Kennedy is killed. Yes, it was only six to eight seconds, depending on estimates, but that is a lifetime for Secret Service agents. Count down six to eight seconds and watch the video of Reagan being shot. These men, by the time the eight second shot, they're well out of there. Let alone two, three, five seconds. Amazing what they did. And Roy Kellerman, for his part, doesn't jump. He doesn't jump back. And he's turned around. He's staring at Kennedy, too. The shooting had stopped by the time Clint Hill, who was assigned to protect the First Lady, finally leapt onto the limousine. Could these monumental lapses by the Secret Service just have been a series of unfortunate oversights? How convenient that this all happened on the day allegedly a lone assassin struck the president down. 1963 protocol, President Kennedy should have lived in Dallas. He should have lived past the Dallas motorcade. But Floyd Boring in charge of protection of the president by planning the Texas trip, Emory Roberts in charge of the fall car, and Bill Greer, the driver of the president's car, those three men bear the largest burden of what went down in Dallas. The buck stops in the Secret Service. Yeah. Roy Kellerman spoke with FBI agents at the president's autopsy. He was quoted with a surprising statement. Agent Kellerman said that the security for this trip was the most stringent and thorough ever employed by the Secret Service for any trip the president ever made. Now, if you believe that, I've got some land I want to sell you. In 1995, the government's Assassination Records Review Board, wanting to compare security in Texas against other recent trips, requested to see all Secret Service documents pertaining to presidential visits around that time. Rather than comply, the Secret Service destroyed many of its records from the fall of 1963 making any true comparisons impossible. Another major discovery of mine, one of two main drivers of JFK's limousine, Secret Service agent Tom Shipman, passed away suddenly of an alleged heart attack and of all places, Camp David on October 14, 1963. So this man died before the assassination of a heart attack, Camp David. And again, I explored this war. I have a full chapter in my next book. I spoke to family members of the late Shipman. And don't do it way about us. They said that, uh, yeah, they, he was quickly buried, and he was earned to be buried quickly. Uh, there was no toxicology reports. It was like a country doctor, a uh, heart attack. There you go. Two days later, he's buried. He's a fit secret surgeon. In fact, he said his widow was surprised he just passed his annual physical, and he's dead of a heart attack. And what does that mean? Thomas Shipman was one of the two main drivers. Sam Kinney was an auxiliary driver. He usually drove the fall apart. Well, Bill Greer is left to drive JFK and Dallas. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for our next speaker. Are you ready? Did you have a good lunch? Did you have a good experience on Diddy Plaza? Are you enjoying the conference? You want to hear this man speak? You want me to shut up? Yes, you do. All right, ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker.
speaker is a giant in the JF, JF conference assassination community. He's a giant literally and figuratively. <laughs> Tonight, Vince Palmar is going to be speaking on the Secret Service and JFK. Vince is the world authority on the Secret Service, has spoken to both medical personnel on duty in Dallas that day, as well as retired agents. He discovered that at least three Secret Service agents who crossed the line, past simple laziness or incompetence, and either cooperated with a conspiracy or allowed it to happen. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Vincent Palmaro. Thank you very much for the enthusiastic intro, and thanks everyone for being here. Uh, yeah, basically that's what it is. I said, what's your theory? Here's my fact. President Kennedy should have survived Dallas. It's as simple as that. And I have a lot of material, so we'll skip all that. Yeah, get right to it. Okay. Now, the first thing is not technically a security issue, but it is a photo coverage eyewitness issue in the lack thereof in Dealey Plaza. Press photo coverage involving professional eye and ear witnesses was still in motion photography. Normally, a flatbed truck was in front of the presidential limousine. Here we are, Honolulu, Hawaii, June of 63. Two flatbed trucks, those are the heroes, in front of the presidential limousine. You wouldn't have had to rely on amateurs like Abraham Zabruder, Orville Nix, everybody else. And Ladies and gentlemen, give me another round of applause for Vince Palomar. Appreciate it. And have him assist me here. We have a little something special here for Vince. On behalf of the JFK Assassination Conference, we are awarding him with the Justice for John F. Kennedy Award from the JFK Assassination Conference for 2019. I want to say a little bit about Vince. Before, uh, before he came in the room, I asked him about how he got involved with this, and he said that Penn Jones Jr. had advised him to pick a topic and research the hell out of it. I think he took Penn Jones' admonishment quite well. I don't, when I think about Secret Service, there's nothing else that comes to my mind other than Vince Palomaro. He is the source authority, is he not? Now, correct me if I'm wrong, I read on the internet, and you know how reliable that can be, that you started this in 1988. Were you in the third grade or what? <laughs> I began my interest in the assassination in 1978. I was 12, so I was like 22. I was 22. I just, my, my mom and dad are still doing great. Huge Kennedy fans. My mom, my mom still cries on certain occasions about President Kennedy. Really affected them deeply. So it affected me. I was born in 1966 after the effect, you know. And it always just struck a chord with me. And then the rest of the system, don't go wrong, I'm also interested in his life, too. But something about his assassination, and it would just make a long story very short. Uh, that very short, like 30 seconds. Uh, what it boils down to is I got four days, that book, um, right now, I should know this, Associated Press, UPI. Anyway, and there's a picture in there of Clint Hill by a limousine. I was interested in a show called The Wild Wild West, a fictional show about the 19th century Secret Service, Robert Conrad. So I was already interested in Secret Service in a weird sort of way. I said, who is that mom? I said, that's Agent Clint Hill. Some reason it just resonated for me. From that moment on, I just started looking at the Secret Service. It was all secondary sources at first, but then I got into primary sources, and it was in the early 90s. In fact, I don't know if Dr. Weck's still here. He called me in 1991, and he doesn't even know how big. He was actually a linchpin for me. He says, you know what you should do? But I even admitted at the time in 1991, I didn't actually speak to any agents. He says, you should do that. You should maybe think about primary research in his wonderful voice. And I started to do that. So actually, Dr. Weck, wherever you are, it's your main impetus as well. So my parents and Dr. Wett. Yeah. One more time, ladies and gentlemen, this Palomaro. Well, ladies and gentlemen,
Keeping a close watch over them is their nine-man Secret Service detail. The Secret Service's main objective is definitely to protect the president. They're not there to investigate. They're not there to necessarily go after an assassin or assassins or to foil a plot. Their whole raison d'etre is to cover and evacuate the president. Head of security for the trip is veteran agent Roy Kellerman. This is his first time in charge. He came from Detroit, Michigan, and he rose quickly through the ranks. He had a funny nickname. They called him Gabby. The reason why they called him Gabby was the exact opposite. He was very soft-spoken and didn't speak much. The Secret Service would fail dramatically in the coming days. But who else knew of the plot to kill the president? The fires of frustration and discord are burning in every city. His words divide America. North and South. By giving his famous June 63 speech, he really fanned the flames in the right wing, the kind of people that President Kennedy himself said, well, we're heading to that country now. Kellerman and his agents are doing their best to create an envelope of security around Jackie and the president. Working as a team, they know exactly what to look for. You're looking for something out of place. You're looking for an angry face, somebody with their hands in their pockets. They'll tell them in a nice way, please remove your hands in your pockets. This is the stressful part of their job. This is what they signed up for. They knew that when they made the White House detail, they were the elite of the elite. Kellerman and his team are about to be tested like never before. It's raining as Air Force One touches down at Carswell Air Force Base. No one aboard expects anyone to notice the presidential party's arrival this late. But as Roy Kellerman looks out of his window, he mutters, I'll be damned. Thousands have braved the rain, hoping to glimpse Jackie. Roy Kellerman, I'm sure he couldn't believe the crowd. It was like they were greeting a rock star. It was like Beatlemania, maybe before Beatlemania began with the Kennedys. It might be terrible weather conditions and late at night, but this might be one's only opportunity to see them up close and personal. Kellerman knows not everyone in Texas will be so welcoming. Tomorrow, they are due in Dallas. It's the end of a long first day for Secret Service agent Roy Kellerman. With his charges secure in Suite 850 of the Hotel Texas, he clocks off. But as Kellerman heads to bed, many of his agents head to the bar. Nine agents drank the night before the assassination. That's grounds for removal from the agency. If they only would have left the front and rear pieces on and even had that open piece in the middle, that would have been a security function. It's a psychological deterrent because so many people wrongly assumed it was bulletproof when an assassin or assassins even try with it on. If you listen to the narration that morning on WFAA ABC, they say, wow, the president is amazing. Instead of getting into the president's limousine, he's heading towards the crowd. Secret Service boss Roy Kellerman may be getting used to this scene, but he's not letting his guard down. You can see Roy Kellerman, everybody, He's looking to see that the various local police and local agents are in place. He's looking to see that rope line is there. He's looking to see everything appears to be normal. The motorcade stretches for half a mile. You had the presidential limousine. You had the Secret Service fob car. You had the mayor's car, then you had the vice president car, and you had the Secret Service fob car for him, other various dignitary cars, local congressmen and senators, you had the, the press and so on. The city of Dallas police have deployed over 700 men, but unusually, none are guarding Dallas's many high-rise rooftops. The major trip before in Florida and Tampa, 28 miles, almost three times the length of Dallas. 
they had multi-story building rooftops guarded with all the sheriff's department with heavy arms. In fact, I spoke to the lead uh, motorcycle officer in Tampa. He told me, oh, every multi-story building at 28 miles had armed men, and they would have shot anybody untoward during that motorcade. Got a pretty good crowd of people down here on Turtle Creek. Halfway down Main Street, FBI Special Agent James Hostie watches the motorcade pass by. He's shocked at how exposed the President and First Lady are. All the Secret Service agents are in the car behind. When you realize the building rooftops weren't guarded, there's people hanging all out of windows, you realize they weren't on the back of the car in a concentrated fashion. And there wasn't more motorcycles bracketing the car, and even the use of the bubble top. It makes you realize how much Kennedy was a sitting duck. 10-4-1 uh, is a pretty good crowd there. The motorcade turns off Main Street and enters Dealey Plaza. And they make a short right-hand turn onto Houston Street. In the presidential car, Jackie hears Governor Connolly's wife say to the president, you certainly can't say that the people of Dallas haven't given you a nice welcome. And the president says, no, you sure can't. Then they make the really tight jog on Elm Street. Now, this was all a violation of Secret Service protocol and common sense. You're never supposed to take the president in a situation where you're slowing the car down like that. The president's car is now turning onto Elm Street, and it will be only a matter of minutes before he arrives at the trademark. I was on Simmons Freeway earlier, and even the freeway was jam-packed with spectators waiting their chance to see the president. The first shot rings out. The vast majority of Daily Plaza witnesses thought it was a firecracker or even a motorcycle backfire. Stand by, please. Something has happened in the motorcade route. Several police officers are rushing up the hill. Something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. Secret Service agent Kellerman screams into his radio. Lawson, this is Kellerman. We've been hit. Wynn Lawson was the agent in the lead car in front of them. We've been hit. Get us to the hospital immediately. Stand by. Jackie Kennedy tries to get out of the limousine. Her pink suit covered in her husband's blood. As the motorcade screeches to a halt, Agent Kellerman helps lift the president out of the car. He said JFK's eyes were opened and it looked like all signs of life were gone, although technically he did have a heartbeat and technically he lived for another 20 to 30 minutes, but for all intents and purposes, he was DOA. Suspicion has also been cast on some of those closest to the president, in particular, Secret Serviceman Roy Kellerman and his team of agents. They definitely felt like they failed their mission. They had one job to do, the number one most important job, the life of the president was taken. Although he never spoke about the assassination, Kellerman hinted he thought there was more to the story than just Lee Harvey Oswald. I spoke to his widow, her name was June, and she said that Roy accepted that there was a conspiracy. In fact, when he spoke to the hostile committee, he says, I'll accept that. It's like, wait, so Roy accepted there was a conspiracy? Yes, he believed there was a conspiracy, but she never got any details from him, nothing. I always thought uh, the valor of the Secret Service, how they would literally, you know, throw themselves in front of ins potential assassins' bullets, and always fascinated me. And the question to me was always, wait a minute, why didn't these agents do more to protect the man? And the more I looked into it, the more I realized there were a lot of anomalies, a lot of questions that needed to be answered on the subject. No one has spent more time studying the Secret Service's actions that day than Vince Palomera. Standard operating procedure in an open motorcade would have been for the agents to be running, walking, or jogging with the presidential limousine. And there was also two handrails in the back for an agent or agents to hold on to, so they would be in close proximity to the president. Agents not riding on the rear of the limo is a huge issue in this case. The Secret Service agents are powerless to really do much of anything if they're not close to the president. And official mythology, I like to call it, is that President Kennedy allegedly ordered the agents off the car four days before Dallas. Claiming President Kennedy asked for changes to the motorcade's normal security protocols, 
had been a recurring theme during the Warren Commission. I spoke to the special agent in charge of the White House detail, the number one agent, Gerald Bain. I asked him, President Kennedy, I understand uh, he was difficult to protect, right? He didn't want the agents on the back of the car, and he told me, this is an exact quote, I don't remember Kennedy ever saying anything about not having agents on the back of the car. If you look at the newsreels, you'll see agents on there. Well, one by one, I spoke to many of his colleagues, not only in the Secret Service, but actually White House aides that were not Secret Service agents, and it was a landslide. They were all telling me the same thing. Supposedly, Kennedy wanted the agents on the back of a limousine. No, no, he had nothing to do with that. The record of history, that is false. President Kennedy, very nice man, not difficult to protect, did not order the agents off the back of the car. This complete departure from procedure is captured here as the motorcade begins to leave Love Field Airport in Dallas. Jogging beside the car was an agent. In the fog car behind him, another agent rises from his seat and does hand gestures like this, obviously to order him to cease and desist. The agent stops his tracks three times, not once, not twice, but three times, goes like this. And actually, that's the universal body language for what is going on. Turns out the agent's name was Don Lawton, and he's the agent who's formerly told to cease and desist by shift leader Emery Roberts, who rises in his seat with the hand gestures, and you see Don Lawton going like this. Don Lawton rode on the back of the car on the Chicago trip earlier in 1963, and four days before in Tampa, but he's relegated to meaningless love field luggage duty during the motorcade, uh, during the assassination. It's ridiculous. Secret Service agent Clint Hill is also recalled from his position on the opposite side of the limousine. Emery Roberts had been the only one of three Secret Service shift leaders from the White House that was part of the motorcade. Emery Roberts was in charge of a follow-up car that was immediately behind JFK, full of Secret Service agents. He was the general, so to speak, of the follow-up car. If he said something, that's how it went. Emery Roberts, however, received his orders from Floyd Boring, the number two man of the Secret Service White House detail, based in Washington. Floyd Boring, he was in charge of planning the Texas trip, and he was the one who gave out assignments. In an interview with the Assassination Records Review Board in 1996, he stated that there had been no change in policy for the Dallas trip, and put the blame on President Kennedy. The number one man, and head of the White House detail, Gerald Bain, was on vacation starting the week before the Texas trip, which left the immediate handling of the trip to Boring. Floyd Boring's right-hand man, in charge of the logistics on the ground in Texas, was Special Agent Winston Lawson. Winston Lawson came from the Buffalo, Syracuse, New York area. He was a former counterintelligence agent in the Army, and he joined the Secret Service in 1959. And again, he was an advance agent, an agent that would actually go to the different cities, towns in America and overseas in advance to uh, work with uh, the local police and dignitaries and whatnot to get everything in line with motorcade rides, building security, etc., etc. Lawson, assisted by Agent Roger Warner, set the order of the vehicles in the Dallas motorcade. The normal order would have been to have a pilot car and a lead car, which was done in Dallas. Then you had a flatbed truck of the press photographers in front of the limousine filming and being eyewitnesses, and that in and of itself was a deterrent. And you had the press buses close behind the limousine, again, professional newsmen, eyewitnesses, they would have been there filming. Conveniently, the press has moved back at the last minute. There wouldn't have been a need for Abraham Zapruder, an amateur, to film the assassination. Another break from routine in the Dallas motorcade, the positioning of police motorcycles around the president's limousine. As with any other motorcade, the Secret Service worked hand in hand with local authorities to ensure the safety of the president. Usually surrounding the car, there would be a group of motorcycles. This was not only to obscure or block the view of potential assassins, but also to prevent anyone from the public who might be viewing who got too excited from approaching the car. And up to and including the day before the assassination, this held true. In his prior Texas stops in San Antonio, Houston, and Fort Worth, 
Normally there were six to nine motorcycle officers around the presidential limousine in a wedge formation, including flanking the car, which means in translation, they were riding right beside JFK. Then all of a sudden there is a last minute change and the motorcycles are reduced to four beside the car, but then they're not even beside the car. They're not flanking anymore. They're moved behind. Translation, the formation was meaningless. It offered no protection at all. In fact, when the shooting began, you don't even see the motorcycle officers around the car. Agent Lawson told the Warren Commission why he had ordered the motorcycles to fall back from the limousine. Well, it's my understanding he couldn't hear conversation well. That's why he didn't want the motorcycles beside him. And yet they had no problem that morning in Fort Worth, the day before in San Antonio and Houston, and four days before, the week before, the month before, the year before, the years before. They left Kennedy a sitting duck. Another line of protection for the president that wasn't used was the limousine's bubble top. The bubble top was a plexiglass covering that was put on the car, the presidential limousine. The conventional wisdom that it was bulletproof or bullet resistant. Turns out it was not bulletproof or bullet resistant in the standard way we think of that. However, it was a psychological deterrent because most people assumed it was bulletproof. Popular belief has it that the limousine's bubble top was not used for two reasons. One, because what started as an overcast and dreary day turned sunny and clear. The actual films and photos of several motorcades shows the bubble top on in the brightest weather conditions imaginable. So there's a myth that it was only on there for inclement weather. Not true. And the bottom line what the bubble top would have done is it would have obscured an assassin's view via the sun's glare. The second reason most often given as to why the bubble top had not been used is that the president had requested not to use it. But I spoke to the agent who was the driver of the follow-up car, Sam Kinney. Sam Kinney adamantly on three different occasions told me that President Kennedy had nothing to do with it. It was solely his responsibility. The bubble top came in six pieces, but sometimes it was on there for just the front and rear pieces were on. So it would be an open car and some semblance of protection as well. A partial bubble top with the front and rear pieces on, and he would be able to get air to be able to stand up and he didn't have that configuration. It's a question of why. Why wasn't at least that configuration used in Dallas? Another troubling inconsistency with Secret Service protocols was the monitoring of buildings. Buildings were not properly monitored in Dallas. Windows were not even properly monitored by the Secret Service. Wynn Lawson said it was his usual instructions to give out these orders to scan the windows along the parade route, but he didn't remember giving out the order or not. And it turns out that Dallas police, who were also involved in security of the motorcade route, said that no orders were given. The bottom line protocol were agents or local police or both were supposed to monitor buildings. Daly Plaza was not properly cleared, was not properly monitored, and the overpasses, any potential overpasses that would have been cleared to spectators and manned by local police. Even more alarming is what happened inside the Secret Service car directly behind the president's limousine once shots rang out. Shift leader Emery Roberts would give an order to the other agents in the car. When the assassination begins, he orders the men not to move. Sam Kinney, the driver of the fall car, who's right beside him, confirmed to me that this happened. He ordered the men not to move at the beginning of the assassination. Henry Roberts supposedly ordered the men not to move. That's exactly right. These men were sworn to protect the president, to dive in front of a bullet if need be, to sacrifice their body. And you mean to tell me this man is going to order them to cease and desist when the shooting begins? <laughs> And just what were the Secret Service agents who were actually inside the president's limousine doing at the time of the shooting? Agents Bill Greer and Roy Kellerman were pivotal to the success of the assassination. And they were pivotal to the success of the assassination through inaction. Bill Greer was the driver of the president's limousine in Dallas. Roy Kellerman was riding right beside him. Greer hits the gas pedal, Kennedy lives. <laughs> first shot rings out. Bill Greer looks back at the president. 
his foot's on the brake too because the car slows down. It's only going 11.2 miles an hour. It's crawling at this point. And then Roy Kelly says, get out of line, we've been hit. That's when Bill Greer turns around a second time and is staring at Kennedy and doesn't do anything until Kennedy is killed. Yes, it was only six to eight seconds, depending on estimates, but that is a lifetime for Secret Service agents. Count down six to eight seconds and watch the video of Reagan being shot. These men, by the time the eight second shot, they're well out of there. Let alone two, three, five seconds. Amazing what they did. And Roy Kellerman, for his part, doesn't jump. He doesn't jump back. And he's turned around. He's staring at Kennedy, too. The shooting had stopped by the time Clint Hill, who was assigned to protect the first lady, finally leapt onto the limousine. Could these monumental lapses by the Secret Service just have been a series of unfortunate oversights? How convenient that this all happened on the day allegedly a lone assassin struck the president down. 1963 protocol, President Kennedy should have lived in Dallas. He should have lived past the Dallas motorcade. But Floyd Boring in charge of protection of the president by planning the Texas trip, Emory Roberts in charge of the fall car, and Bill Greer, the driver of the president's car, those three men bear the largest burden of what went down in Dallas. The buck stops of the Secret Service. Yeah. Roy Kellerman spoke with FBI agents at the president's autopsy. He was quoted with a surprising statement. Agent Kellerman said that the security for this trip was the most stringent and thorough ever employed by the Secret Service for any trip the president ever made. Now, if you believe that, I've got some land I want to sell you. In 1995, the government's Assassination Records Review Board, wanting to compare security in Texas against other recent trips, requested to see all Secret Service documents pertaining to presidential visits around that time. Rather than comply, the Secret Service destroyed many of its records from the fall of 1963 making any true comparisons impossible. From his hometown of Duluth in Minnesota, one of those questioning critics of the official version of events is Professor James Fetzer. The resurgence of interest in the death of JFK had repercussions when Congress passed the JFK Records Act in 1992 that created a five civilian member board entrusted with the responsibility to review and declassify documents that were held by the CIA, the Secret Service, the Office of Naval Intelligence and so forth. We know from its own report that it had some significant failures. For example, and the Secret Service, which deliberately destroyed motorcade records that would have revealed that the motorcade in Dallas was a travesty 
a violation of at least 15 different Secret Service policies for presidential protection. This behavior on their part raises the most serious and disturbing questions about their complicity in the entire affair. From the moment he arrived in Dallas, the president's protection was suspect, according to Vince Palomara, a Secret Service expert. There was last minute changes invoked by the Secret Service involving President Kennedy's security. Specifically, agents were told not to ride on or near the rear of the limousine. Now these orders were funneled from the assistant and special agent in charge of the White House detail, who was the planner of the Texas trip, Floyd Boring, to one of his assistants, a shift leader by the name of Emery Roberts, who was in charge of the follow-up car. You can see an agent, Henry Ribka, doing his normal duty, jogging besides the limousine, when in the follow-up car, you can see Emery Roberts stand up and wave him back. And you can see a very perplexed agent Ribka waving his arms in the air several times in seeming disgust. There was another last minute change made at Love Field invoked by the Secret Service. The Dallas Police Department motorcycle outriders were told not to be beside the car. It went from four to six down to a measly two riders on each side. And to add insult to injury, they were pushed further back in the motorcade by those agents not being by the car, by those motorcycle officers not being in the position. It opened up President Kennedy to a field of fire from in front and from the rear. In the months before the trip to Texas, there had been a growing number of threats against the president's life. Despite the increase in conspiratorial activity in the month of November 1963, in the apparent red alert the Secret Service appears to be under in response to this activity, the agency acts in the opposite fashion and actually reduces the security and acts like no threats on the president's life are occurring. Why? Uniquely on that day in Dallas, the press, the camera crews, Kennedy's military aide, who would normally sit in the front of the president's car, and even his personal physician, were all relegated to the rear of the motorcade by the Secret Service. In a conventional motorcade, the president would be somewhere in the middle, surrounded by security and the press. In this case, the presidential limousine was set right out in front of every other limousine, which of course is the reason why the Secret Service destroyed the records of its own motorcades when they were asked for them by the Assassination Records Review Board. The most suspicious behavior by shift leader Emery Roberts was to be at the time of the shooting in Dealey Plaza. Tragically, he actually ordered the agents not to move during the heart of the shooting. Agent Sam Kinney, who drove the fob car, admitted as much to me and told me, quote, exactly right, end quote. And all these deficiencies begin and end with the Secret Service because they were the prime movers. They were the ones who were directing the security arrangements from Washington up to and including in the heart of Dallas during security meetings. They were the ones that gave out assignments vetoed or approved of security arrangements so the buck stops with them i have a book coming out called survivor's guilt the secret service and the failure to protect president kennedy it is the first time the secret service has ever been investigated in research in such depth hundreds of footnotes and it's primary source information it's not theories it's fact it's what these agents told me it's what they said and did it's based off films and photos, documental, documentable evidence, documents, books, whatnot. But it's not just secondary sources, it's not theory, it's fact. It's what these agents told me. Survivor's Guilt, The Secret Service, and the Failure to Protect the President, coming out September 1st, 2013, available for pre-order on Amazon.com. Everything is being uh, uh, accepted as far as what PPD is doing and will continue to do.
news footage was black and white then, but several amateur photographers caught the motorcade on color film. Channel 4 had two reporters along the route. Bob Huffaker was downtown. In response to political staff, agents who usually surround the limousine were pulled away so people could see the president better. One reacted by throwing up his hands in disgust. Three times he protested what would prove to be a fatal error. Kennedy was killed by the third shot from a sniper rifle, well after agents, if they had been nearby. Agents who usually surround the limousine were pulled away so people could see the president better. One reacted by throwing up his hands in disgust. Three times he protested what would prove to be a fatal error. Kennedy was killed by the third shot from a sniper rifle, well after agents, if they had been nearby. I interviewed a guy called Clint Hill, who was the bodyguard. If you see the footage of the uh, of the cavalcade yeah. and the bullets coming, he's the guy that jumps on the back. Yeah, uh, he's actually he was Jackie Kennedy's bodyguard. Yeah, on and she why were the Secret back. Service on the bumper that day? They were removed. You can go on uh, on internet. That's and not see what it. he told me. They were removed from the bumper. That's and not the not Secret he... Service guy turns to his Jesse, boss and goes, "What? Jesse, here's my point." And they took him off the bumper. Why did they change the way that? For Dallas only, the way the motorcycles were lined up, they put four of them way in front and the others all behind. They didn't go in the standard wedge, which was used in the two previous days before. But in Dallas, that changed. They got them out of the way to give a clear shooting lane. Let me finish my point. Clint Hill, who was there and was on the back of that limo, he, he wasn't said, on the back of it. He jumped on the back of it. Yeah, from a car way behind and it Correct. took him how long to get there. But he believed... Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. Now, me, why do you know more than he does? Well, because of the fact there's a whole lot of information. Um, there is so obvious when you read this book. I'll let you people be the judge. Read the book. It's so obvious. The, the Secret Service. Oh, who do you think did it? The Secret Service protected Kennedy more after death than they did when he was alive because they illegally took the body out of Texas. Autopsy by law should have gone on there. Lyndon Johnson, the car was a crime scene. Everybody knows tape goes around a crime scene until forensic gets through with it. Monday morning, that car was in Michigan being refurbished, already moved. Yes. No one was allowed to see the car. Huh? The most painful theories point fingers at the agents themselves. I read where Pontius was part of it because uh, he disappeared after Houston. A conspiracy for the agents to shoot the president. I mean, this is off the wall. One of the agents shot him. Memories of 1963 come back to life for so many Americans today. The assassination of President John F. Kennedy shocked and some think changed the world. News 13's John Lee gives us a local tie to that tragedy. Did a little research on just who this character was. At the place where those who pass rest in peace, one grave at Green Hill Cemetery in Waynesville is a reminder of America's turmoil, where folks like Steve Fogg find it fascinating that... We have a little bit of uh, uh, the JFK assassination story right here in our, our backyard. William Greer was a World War II veteran, eventually working with the Secret Service. Driving JFK in, in Dallas 50 years ago. A life journey that merged with a devastating death. President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Greer retired and eventually moved to Waynesville. Glenn Stewart says he heard stories of Greer playing golf at the country club. You yeah, know, I was surprised to find out about that, and uh, so that led to an interest in uh, finding out where he's buried over here in Waynesville. Glenn was told he rarely spoke of that assassination. When it was brought up that he was pretty, you know, closed mouthed about it, he didn't want anybody to have, he didn't want to cause any more controversy, I'm sure. We spoke to JFK expert Vince Palomara via Skype. There's a lot of people that, rightly so, in my opinion, believe that he is responsible indirectly for the assassination because again, they're you know, Secret Service agents are trained. If he hits the gas and obeys an order of the agent in charge that was sitting next to him, history would have been different. The author of Survivor's Guilt interviewed Greer's son about his late father, concluding that the Secret Service agent was tormented for years. He had a lot of guilt about what happened in Dallas because whether or not he believed Oswald acted alone or not, if you know his dad would have hit the gas, President Kennedy would be alive today. Greer died of cancer in 1985, but speculation and conspiracy theories live on.
you know, there's been a lot of controversy, and there's even some theory that uh, he was involved in the in the killing. Theories that Palomara says bothered the family. His son was pretty forthcoming about his dad. He kind of wavered back and forth. I think his son, frankly, wasn't too uh, thrilled about the notion out there that people thought that maybe he had something to do with it as far as if he would have hit the gas and so forth. But, you know, I, I, I could kind of read between the lines. I could tell it was something that definitely bothered his father judging by how defensive his son was about it. In five decades after that turbulent and tragic chapter, many replay the horror in their minds. And my thought is this is going to go on forever to the end of time. Imagining what people like Bill Greer took to their grave. I'm sure it haunted him uh, being, being where he was when he was. In Waynesville, John Lee, News 13. With in-depth study of the failings of Secret Service protections. These men were sworn to protect the president, to dive in front of a bullet if need be, to sacrifice their body. And when the assassination begins, he orders the men not to move. 1963 protocol, President Kennedy should have lived. This moving examination of new evidence and interviews uncovers the dramatic tale of a coup in Camelot. Why didn't these agents do more to protect the man? And the more I looked into it, the more I realized there were a lot of anomalies, a lot of questions that needed to be answered on the subject. No one has spent more time studying the Secret Service's actions that day than Vince Palomera. Now, we've got some video from YouTube. Uh, one of the things you say in your book that made you want to write this book was all the conspiracy theories. And you talked about the movie from Oliver Stone. This is a man named Vince Palomara. Uh, Do you know him? I'm familiar with him. I don't know him. He says that, I guess, that it, you know, we'll talk about this, that he sent you a 22-page letter. I recall receiving a letter, which I sent back to him. I didn't bother with it. You didn't talk to him ever? He called me, and I said hello, but that was about it. And over the years, have you both been called about this assassination on many occasions? I've been called numerous times. What's been your attitude? What, how, how have you approached uh, people? That For the most part, I've just said I have no comment. I just have nothing to say. And why is that? <clears throat> well, I, most of it's from people who are writing conspiracy theory books that don't make any sense to me. So if they're not going to deal in fact, then I don't want anything to do with it. And how about you? What have you been Same thing. I, uh, I have never talked to an author of a book. And uh, that uh, I just felt... We have it on our commission books, worthy of trust and confidence. And uh, I felt those were issues that you should never talk to anybody on the outside about. And it was, uh, I had to weigh and evaluate when I wrote this book because I felt I wasn't talking about the Secret Service. Uh, I wasn't talking about the Kennedy family, but I was talking with, about the agents that I worked with and the incidents that occurred. And uh, those were my friends. So that's what I decided to write. Did you have to get permission to do this from the Secret Service? No. no. So this wasn't cleared by the Secret Service? No. Okay. no, but we had uh, lunch today with the uh, director of the Secret Service who uh, thanked us very much for uh, our contribution. So. Here is this video, it's not very long. And this man's name is Vince Palomara. He's a citizen who has taken it on his own to become an expert. He's from Pennsylvania, and I don't know him. I've never talked to him. I've just seen it on the web. And he is, a, I believe he's a graduate of Duquesne University. So let's watch this and I'll get your reaction okay. to it. Hi, this is Vince Palomara, the self-described Secret Service expert that Jerry Blaine accuses me of without naming me, okay? Um, back with my obsession about the Kennedy detail. I gotta read this, this is rich. Page 287, this is what Blaine's claiming Raleigh said. Raleigh turned to Jerry Blaine, and Jerry, since you were in the lead car, did you ever hear this over your radio as well? Yes, sir, I did. I heard exactly what Floyd just told you. The thing about this is the whole thing about the Ivy League charlatans thing. Jerry Blaine told me the Ivy League Charlatans thing came from the guys. I can't remember. I can't remember who said it. Boy, his memory got real good five years later because now he's claiming he heard it over the radio. Floyd Boring, okay? It's 
just unbelievable. It just, it, it just, it's just amazing to me, you know. There never would have been a book if I didn't send a 22-page letter, okay, to Clint Hill that pissed him off so much that his very good friend Jerry Blaine came out with this book as a counter, okay. There's some nice things I recommend everybody to buy. I don't mind the censorship. This is my First Amendment rights, okay. It's got some nice pictures, some nice non-assassination things. And there's even some good assassination related things in here. But... It's very obvious since other people picked up on it. That's why there's some really bad reviews on Amazon right now. Mine's the best of a bunch of three stars, too. It's very obvious it's a thinly veiled attempt to rewrite history and to blame President Kennedy without trying to blame him for his own assassination. Uh, first of all, his is not the best of the reviews. There are seven with five stars, just in case for the record that I saw today when I looked on Amazon. What's your reaction? Could you hear? Well, he wrote an assessment of the book about uh, the first time about five weeks before it was released. The second time on Amazon.com, he and four of his friends or four of his aliases uh, put a statement uh, on assessing the book a one, a two, and a three. Uh, my assessment, uh, Mr. Palomera, is that uh, he called probably all of the agents and uh, uh, what agent who answers a phone is going to answer a question, was President Kennedy easy to protect? Well, probably he was too easy to protect because he was assassinated. But uh, uh, the fact that the agents aren't going to tell him anything, and he alludes to the fact that when I wrote uh, the book, most of these people were dead. Well, I worked with these people. I knew them like brothers, and uh, uh, I knew exactly what was going on, and I always respected Jim Rowley because he stood up to the issue and said, look, we can't say the president invited himself to be killed, so let's squash this. So that was the, uh, the word throughout the Secret Service, and uh, uh, he, uh, Mr. Palomera, has... Uh, there are a number of things that have happened, but uh, uh, he has no credibility. He's a self-described uh, expert in his area, which I don't know what it is. He was born after the assassination, and he keeps creating solutions to the assassination until they're proven wrong. So he's... Uh, uh, a lot of that... Go ahead. He alleges that... Uh, because he sent me a letter, 22 pages in length apparently, and that I discussed that with Jerry. I forgot that I ever got a 22-page letter from this particular individual until I heard him re say it on TV. And I never discussed it with Jerry or anybody else because it didn't, wasn't important to me. Uh, and insofar as him being an expert, I don't know where the expert part came from. I, I spent a long time in the Secret Service in protection and I'm not an expert, but apparently he became an expert somewhere up in Pennsylvania. I don't know where. You were about to say something earlier. Uh, the Zapruder film, uh, when the Zapruder film is run at normal speed, another theme uh, that Paul Amara throws out is that Bill Greer stopped the car. Uh, when it's run at uh, its normal speed, you'll notice the car absolutely does not start stop at all. Uh, this happened in less than six seconds after the president was hit in the throat and moving along. That As an aside, by the way, uh, the fellow we talked about in the last interview, Vince uh, Palomara, yeah. have you seen his letter to the uh, about your book? I've not read it, no. I'm sure you probably know that he said <clears throat> that Mrs. Kennedy and me is highly recommended to everyone for its honesty and rich body of truth. He actually fully endorsed your book, even though he's been critical of... Uh... Well, I'll accept his Are endorsement. Are you worried that he's being... Well, I, maybe he has some secret uh, agenda. I don't know, but uh, I accept his praise. Thank you. In your... Uh, Jerry and I talked about this a lot because I'd, I'd read something or read reports and I'd say, Jerry, this contradicts what you're telling me or what Clint tell, is telling me. And um, I came to realize that these were the guys that were there. 
and their memories are so vivid and so clear. And as I would talk to other agents, they would corroborate the stories. And um, I realized that this is the truth. Mm -hmm. And the other people that are writing these other reports and all these researchers that have studied this endlessly, they weren't there. And, um, you know, there's, so you can take some of what is written, but what I believe is what these men have told me to be true. The greatest security ever, even the normal security on both the federal and local levels had been stripped away. Another short one for you, another four minute DVD. But what I want to do is, again, it's one thing to come up here and espouse things, you know, say things and that, but picture says a thousand words and it's, it's the great conundrum. Now I said before, you know, about a conspiracy, no conspiracy, and it's separate from that. It's a matter of these guys would have protected the president. He would have lived whether Oswald act alone or not. There is a little bit of a gray area in there. And it depends, quite frankly, sometimes it depends on my mood or some of my researcher friends uh, work on me a little bit to make it, me think it is sinister. I don't know. I mean, you try to put the best foot forward and say they screwed up and the president was killed under their watch. And after the fact, they created this mythology that he was difficult to protect. And that's when you read William Manchester's massive best-selling book. It sold like in the millions, you know, day Kennedy was shot, even the Warren Report to a certain extent, laid out this thing that, well, oh, President Kennedy, that's a shame, but you know, he did not want you know, the protection. Now, you didn't hear me get into the bubble top. That does seem to be something that Kennedy didn't want all the time, but even that is a gray area. There's many trips, you'll see a couple of them coming up, where he had the bubble top on, if not in a full compartment, which he did quite often. A lot of other times he'd have it in a partial configuration where he'd have the rear piece on and the forward piece. Now, even though it was not bulletproof, it would deflect a bullet. And many agents I spoke to said it would deflect a bullet, or at the very least, actually two things, or it would uh, have a sun's glare off the uh, bubble, would, would act as a deterrent, or just the fact that many people thought it was bulletproof. Would a potential sniper or snipers think twice, if not thrice, about doing anything? Oh, the bubble top's on, or the rear piece is on. So there you go. Many times, um, you'll see coming up, uh, Kennedy was allotted many motorcycles that surrounded the car. It was protocol. In fact, on the Texas trip, San Antonio, Houston, and that morning in Fort Worth, the morning of the assassination, he had motorcycles all over the place in the high select committee. This is kind of, well, it's not buried. Researchers know about it, but it's buried in their um, report. Most people know about the Warren Report. High select committee reinvestigated the assassination in the late 70s and found a probable conspiracy, but very inconclusive, very unsatisfying. But one of the things they found was it was, quote, uniquely insecure what the Secret Service did with the allotment of motorcycles. And guess what? They blamed it on Kennedy. They said, hey, Kennedy didn't like this noise of the motorcycles by him. He couldn't have conversation. Geez, it must have been a new thing, because he didn't mind having this motorcycle all around him, up to and including the morning of the murder. He gets to Dallas. Hey, I want to hear now. Hey, get these motorcycles away. Hey, I didn't mind the, the agents beside me here. Oh, get them away now. And uh, yeah, the press and photographers, you wouldn't need Abraham Zabruder. Normally, the press and photographers were in front, and you'll see in a second. Again, pictures, you don't have to... Believe me, you'll see for your own. The vantage point, a lot of times there was a flatbed truck in front of the murder cage. The capture there, the national and international press, or just like the local press and the photographers capturing the murder cage. You wouldn't need all these amateurs. Hmm, they were removed at the last minute. Tom Dillard even testified to the Warren Commission that they left them in Chevrolet convertibles that put them totally out of the picture, literally, because they were stuck way back in the motorcade. They didn't even know what happened until it was too late. If they would have been in front, they would have been filming. Hey, and they would have saw everything. Again, he might say, what's motorcycles going to do? If it was a sniper, it was a sniper. No. What it was, there would have been more professional witnesses to cover. Now, they would have covered them on the sides. Yes, you're right from a sniper's perspective. But if agents, now the Secret Service has even admitted this. So it wasn't like, oh, this is your theory about what they would have done. The Secret, Louis Moretti testified in the late 90s about this, okay? That if agents would have been on the back of the car, it would have obscured Oswald's view. So agents being there would have been very important. Again, so it's their own words. But again, before you know, anyone thought twice about this, they would throw out, well, President Kennedy, God bless him, it's a shame, but you know, he didn't want this protection. But as you see, he didn't have a problem at all. And I'm contacting these people. And here's the most important thing of all, especially if you go out and you get Gerald Blaine's book, which I'm not, you know, spas and dates, free country, get it if you want. You know, and if you go in there and you read and you say, well, you know, we had a code, he's talking about the Secret Service, and, uh, you know, that code shouldn't be broken, and, you know, I'm, I'm waiting 47 years to tell you that President Kennedy did indeed order us out of the car, and we covered this up. The thing he left out of the book, 
the real glaring error is, what about the non-Secret Service agents that said President Kennedy never wore us the car? You know, uh, Dave Powers, who was on every trip Kennedy uh, took, he was riding in the fob car often, writes to a total stranger and says, they never had to be told to be, get off the back of the car. Congressman Sam Givens, again, total stranger, writing to him, said that the agents rode on the rear of the car all the way. He was, he was sitting a foot away from Kennedy. He never heard any order. So I'll wrap this up. Hi, Vince Palomera. Thought I'd give a little quick synopsis of my five books in the major DVD and Blu-ray I'm in. First one is Survivor's Guilt, The Secret Service and the Failure to Protect President Kennedy. This came out in 2013. Many years of hard labor on this one, a lot of work. It was contacting all the surviving former agents who protected President Kennedy and other presidents too, from FDR through Reagan. And all these gentlemen have since passed away, and this is a, if I do say so myself, it's a good, uh, maybe even a very good uh, look at the Secret Service and what they did and did not do to protect President Kennedy. And the value of this is that a lot of these agents have since passed away, so it's good to have their thoughts on record. This book has done very well. Again, came out in 2013, my first book. Second book is JFK from Parkland to Bethesda came out in 2015 and like the first one it's done very well did very well right out of the shoots and uh still doing well like the first one this one focuses on the medical evidence all the parkland and bethesda witnesses and all points in between and what it does is it's literally trying to compile every statement verbal or written from all the people from parkland and bethesda and all points in between about president kennedy's wounds so in other words Every time Robert McClellan made a comment about the wounds, it's there, and Dr. Perry and Dr. Jenkins, et cetera, et cetera. You get to see changing stories. You get to see the people that were consistent, so on and so forth. What it was was it was a reaction to all these uh, authors, well-meaning, would always say, you know, 26 witnesses said the back of the president's head was gone, the throat wound was an entrance wound, you know, the X amount of witnesses. And I was like, okay, exactly who, when did they say it, how many times they say it, were they consistent? This is the answer to that. Third one is the Not-So-Secret Service. This came out in 2017. You see like a two-year interval. First one was 2013, second one was 2015, this third one was 2017. It's done pretty well, decent. Um, this was basically a loose ends of my first book on the Secret Service, things that came out since the book came out and things that confirm and corroborate certain things as well. And also a brief look at the agents from FDR to Reagan but it's mainly on the Kennedy assassination. And big claim to fame of this one is Gary Byrne, former Secret Service officer, wrote Question of Character. Well, in the second book, he uses as a source. This is my fourth book. Came out the very next year of 2018. I broke the two years thing because I wasn't 100% happy with this one. I thought that um, it didn't really succeed as a book. It was good information, but book-wise, it was a little lacking. This one is, I'm really proud of, but unlike all my other books, this one pretty much stiffed. Didn't really sell as well. One good claim to fame, though, was three-time Pulitzer Prize winning author Carol Leonig of Zero, Fail, Fame, and Dr. or not Dr. Donald Trump. He wishes he was a doctor. Donald Trump uh, fame. She wrote an anti-Trump book. Well, she uses this as a source. And like I said, I'm very proud of this book. This goes back really from Lincoln, because Lincoln basically found the Secret Service, all the way up to the Trump era. It's all the most renowned, infamous, good, bad, ugly Secret Service agents, and this is what this is. And like I said, just for some reason, this didn't really catch hold with a lot of people, but not from a quality standpoint, no, they didn't like it. It's just, quite frankly, this didn't do as well as the other ones, but that's that. This one is Carry On the Traditions. My fifth book came out 2021, Honest Answers by the murder of President John F. Kennedy, and you look at the JFK assassination. Like the first and second books, this has done very well. It's been out a little over a year. And this is a look at the JFK assassination as far as all the hard evidence of conspiracy. No theories, just everything laid out there. Kind of like what I did with my first and second book. The first book details all about the JFK 
Agents, the second book's all about the medical evidence. Well, this one is like, okay, I want to know what is the hard evidence of conspiracy in the Kennedy assassination. This is it. This is what we know, what we don't know, probably what we'll never know. I'm very honest about it. And this is it. And like I said, thank you, everybody. The reaction has been very well. Finally, just want to say, I'm in the Men Who Killed Kennedy that was, you know, on DVD and VHS, and it's on YouTube, and that's done pretty well. And I'm also in a new UK documentary. I think it's being shown in Australia. UK and it should be worldwide soon. It's just simply called The Assassination of JFK. Well, in the meantime, on DVD and Blu-ray, you can see my major appearance in A Coup in Camelot. It's also available on television and Amazon Prime. I'm very proud of this. I'm on there about 15 minutes, and the acclaimed actor and narrator, Peter Coyote, um, narrates my uh, talk on here, and I think it did really well. So um, that's basically it. Thanks for watching. Hi, my name is Vince Palomera, and I'm a Secret Service expert. I've interviewed over 80 former agents, many of whom protected President Kennedy and other presidents going back from FDR up to Reagan. I'm the author of five books. My latest is Honest Answers About the Murder of President Kennedy. For that, I had a book called Who's Who in the Secret Service. The third book was The Not-So-Secret Service. The second book was JFK from Parkland to Bethesda. And the book I'm probably most well known for is Survivor's Guilt, The Secret Service, The Failure to Protect President Kennedy. Today's date is November 21st, 2016. Tomorrow will be the 53rd anniversary of the Kennedy assassination. And as you can see, I'm standing here in Dealey Plaza, Dallas, Texas, here for a conference where I'm presenting today in about an hour or so. And uh, here is the infamous grassy knoll. And there's Abraham Zabruder's pedestal as well. And over here, you can catch us between the trees, that building there. Is the Texas School Book Depository. So right there, smack on those trees is Texas School Book Depository. And over here is Houston Street. Kennedy made the turn before Elm Street. And over here is Main Street. This motor came up and went straight down. He would have missed the grassy knoll in the book depository. And over here is the underpass. And uh, yeah, this is where the Secret Service biggest failure in their history happened. And I've interviewed many former Secret Service agents, White House agents, and other sundry people. And uh, that's the subject of my first book, Survivor's Guild. And it's actually the subject of my third book. Uh, second book is on medical evidence. And uh, thank you very much. Today's date is November 23rd, 2019. Here I am actually on Elm Street. This is the spot where President Kennedy was assassinated. There's the book depository, grassy knoll. Get a panoramic view real quick. This is it, this is the spot. Here's my shadow. Okay. Today's day is the 22nd, 2019, 56th anniversary. This is the famous grassy knoll where many people think that folks like Abraham, at least one of the bench it's right about in here. Right about in here is where many people think the shots came from. They also think the shots may have originated from this part of the place. This is against official history. There's the Triple Underpass. This is the view from Elm Street here. Today's date is November 22nd, 2019, the 56th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination. We're here in the Plaza, Dallas, Texas, where President Kennedy was assassinated. And still, the majority of people believe that there's a conspiracy and a shock team in the grassy room over there. To the book of my personal 
opinion is Oswald's rifle was involved, and Oswald did not fire the rifle. Someone else used his rifle to set him up as a patsy, which was a crossfire, and thus a conspiracy. This is the view from the stockade fence and the grassy knoll. Interestingly, a train has come by now. There's a triple underpass. There's a man named Ben Pather. Today's day is November 23rd, 2019. I am on the South Mole. Okay, it's the South Mole. Dealey Plaza, again, November 23rd, 2019. This is all gated now over here. But we are going to come upon the South Mole, the opposite pergola. That one gets all the attention, and rightfully so. But here's the other one. In fact, this gets no attention at all. I'm the only person here. I am the only person here. This is the WPA Works Project Administration project. And here it is. This is the South Knoll. This is it, the South Knoll. This is the South Mole, the other pergola, the one that gets zero attention. This is it. Here's the more famous pergola. This is the view from it that look. Here's the Texas Gold Depository, now the Sixth Field Museum. There you have it. Today's day is November 23rd, 2019. Up on the grassy knoll behind the stockade fence. Here's the view from the triple underpass or overpass because it's a terminology. Here we are. President Kennedy should have went down that way, Main Street. That way, Main Street. This is Elm Street, where he was assassinated. Again, we're on top of the Triple Underpass, Steely Plaza, Dallas, Texas. Decided the assassination of President Kennedy 56 years and a day ago. Today's day is November 23rd, 2019. <laughs> There's the book depository where Oswald's rifle was fired from, but Oswald did not fire it. And shoes from the front as well. This is where the late Sherry Feister thought the headshot came from. They've now blocked this off. There's Abraham's Bruder's pedestal. Yeah. 
We're going to climb up on Abraham's Brewer's pedestal. Excuse me when I get down. Today's day is November 22nd, 2019, here in Dealey Plaza. There's Amanda. Here I am. Today's date is November 23rd, 2019. Dallas, Texas, Steely Plaza. There's the Texas School Book Depository, now the Six World Museum. Here's the pergola. I am on the Winter's Perch right now. There's a man and Ben Papp right there. And here is what the Bruiser saw. There is the stockade fence in the grassy knoll. And behind. It's very obvious it's a thinly veiled attempt to rewrite history and to blame President Kennedy without trying to blame him for his own assassination. He alleges that uh, because he sent me a letter, 22 pages in length apparently, and that I discussed that with Jerry. I forgot that I ever got a 22-page letter from this particular individual until I heard him re say it on TV. And I never discussed it with Jerry or anybody else because it didn't wasn't important to me. Uh, and insofar as him being an expert, I don't know where the expert part came from. I, I spent a long time in the Secret Service in protection, and I'm not an expert, but apparently he became an expert somewhere up in Pennsylvania I don't know where. As an aside, by the way, uh, the fellow we talked about in the last interview, Vince uh, Palomara, yeah. have you seen his letter to the uh, about your book? I've not read it, no. I'm sure you probably know that he said <clears throat> that Mrs. Kennedy and me is highly recommended to everyone for its honesty and rich body of truth. He actually fully endorsed your book, even though he's been critical of... Uh, <clears throat> well, I'll accept his endorsement. Are you worried that he's <laughs> being... <laughs> well, I, maybe he has some secret uh, agenda, I don't know, but uh, I accept his praise. Thank you. Uh, my assessment of Mr. Palomera is that uh, he called probably all of the agents and uh, uh, what agent who answers a phone is going to answer a question, was President Kennedy easy to protect? Well, Probably he was too easy to protect because he was assassinated. But uh, uh, the fact that the agents aren't going to tell him anything, and he alludes to the fact that when I wrote uh, the book, most of these people were dead. Well, I worked with these people. I knew them like brothers, and uh, uh, I knew exactly what was going on. And I always respected Jim Rowley because he stood up to the issue and said, look, we can't say the president invited himself to be killed, so let's squash this. So, uh, he, uh, Mr. Palomera, is, uh, there are a number of things that have happened, but uh, uh, he has no credibility. He's a self-described uh, expert in his area, which I don't know what it is. He was born after the assassination, and he keeps creating solutions to the assassination until they're proven wrong. So he's... Uh, 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 the Zapruder film 
Uh, when the Zapruder film is run at normal speed, another theme uh, that Paul Amara throws out is that Bill Greer stopped the car. Uh, when it's run at uh, its normal speed, you'll notice the car absolutely does not start, stop at all. Uh, this happened in less than six seconds after the president was hit in the throat. There are so many stories out there that are strictly theory. People claim that they're experts. They have no basis to make that claim. I was in a special agent in charge of vice president protection, special agent in charge of presidential protection, and assistant director of protective forces for the United States Secret Service. I'm not an expert, but apparently some of these people out there who write these books and concoct these theories are experts. People as diverse as Vince Bugliosi, the History Channel, the Assassination Records Review Board, and even ironically, Brian Lamb have called me a Secret Service expert. I mean, it is what it is.